Right, this meeting of the caucus for the 2019 election cycle is now called to order. We will start, if you would please stand, with the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you all. Someday I'll figure this out. First of all, I want to thank everybody for turning out. I thought at the nominating meeting we had the best turnout in the eight years I've served the caucus, and we've topped that tonight because we set up about 15 or 20 more chairs, and we still have standing room only. So thank you all. This is your village. This is your caucus, and we like your being involved in this process. I want to thank the Village Board for making this facility available to us, although I hope they'll take note of how crowded it is and maybe come up with a solution to that in the future, and the nominees as well that may come up on your watch. And I want to thank Phil Zegarelli for helping to save us the custodial fees that we'd otherwise be charged. The Village has taken good care of the caucus. Um, the Rec Department has been helpful as well arranging for coffee to be here and water so you have some refreshments. Um, so far we've received some questions already submitted from residents. There are index cards in the back. If anyone else has a question they choose to submit, I will review them and determine whether or not they're better questions than the executive committee has prepared, in which case we'll either substitute them or we'll ask the candidates at the end if they'd like to forego closing statements and take additional questions. Um, the order of the debate has been selected so that uh, by drawing numbers from left to right we will start the questioning. We will continue with a response. There will be three minutes for an opening statement, two minutes to answer a question, one minute for an additional response or rebuttal of other answers that have been given. Then we'll reverse the order and go right to left. That's hopefully the fairest way. And I think you'll all have noticed by now that Mayor Sullivan is not present. It's my understanding that she underwent surgery today and couldn't make the meeting. She prepared her opening and closing remarks and has asked Lou Wachtel to present them on her behalf. The caucus executive committee made the decision to do that. This has been an unprecedented event. We did our best acting on the spur of a moment to attempt to be fair to all. Um, we also have a sign-up sheet in the back if you could provide us with your email addresses if you want to be kept informed about what's going on in the caucus. And we have another sign-up sheet to seek volunteers to help with collecting independent nominating petitions for the candidates that the caucus selects at the special voting meeting on January 23rd at the Youth Center. Um, Lou, when he is called for uh, Lori's speech, will come up to the podium rather than sit at the dais with the candidates, and he will be able to present her opening statement, and he'll be called up at the end to present her closing statement. All right, each nominee will start now with three minutes to introduce themselves, starting from left to right, Stephen Vessio. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody, for coming this evening. I'd, I'd like to send my best wishes to uh, Mayor Sullivan on a speedy recovery. Uh, I'd like to thank all the candidates for being here as well. I told you a little bit last time about who I am. I'm a lifelong resident, a 15-year fireman in the village. I'm four years on the planning board, and I chaired the B-Zone Committee. We're facing some really big challenges as a village right now. If we don't handle them the right way, this community will not look the same. We need good leaders in place that are going to accept responsibility and stand by their word. Insecure leaders will defer blame and take credit for others' accomplishments. When you've been in office long enough, you can no longer say it was their fault. You have to own it, or you'll never be successful. You also can't hide from the facts, which, thanks to FOIA legislation, makes them readily available to all of us. With that said, I'd like to correct the statement Mr. Wilson made last, meet, last week 
when he stated, as a planning board member, I voted to permit bulldozing of trees and vegetative screening so the club could construct a parking lot up against the property of residents on Lodge Road. That is completely inaccurate. What we voted on in 2016 was the phasing of the club, which actually resulted in two fewer buildings being built and the parking garage being eliminated. The eyesore that the Lodge Road residents suffer is a result of a lack of enforcement on the village's behalf. What's being done up there does not comply with the plans. The berm that was built to screen the view is about 10 times as small as it should be, and it is barely planted with any trees. The plans call for densely planted evergreens. Why did we allow this to happen? Why did we allow the large trees in the parking lot to be removed? Why have the municipal officials not visited here until recently? Sounds like campaign rhetoric to me. Leaders need to own their responsibilities, and I will. There's been a lot of talk about accomplishments and successes as well. But what is a success? Webster's defines it as a favorable or desirable outcome. We should be careful to not confuse mediocrity as a success. Celebrating rebuilding a pavilion that was burned by an arsonist, or replacing a playground destroyed by trees with no shade, or spending 167000 of taxpayer money on intersection work that didn't improve safety when we needed a much larger project should not be considered successes. There have been promises of improving Chilmark Park, the Youth Center, and Scarborough Park by these same individuals sitting here as far back as 2015, yet no action has been taken. These are broken promises. I pledge that if I commit myself to something, I will follow it through. Growing up in Briarcliff, I always saw it as a step above the rest. Due to a void of leadership and vision on the current board, we've lost some of that edge, but we can get it back with forward thinking and fresh insight. With that said, I'm thrilled to endorse Peter and Ned for trustees. They're incredibly smart people with great work ethic and the skill set we need right now in Briarcliff. I pledge to you, I will represent your interests and work as hard as I can on your behalf. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Bessier. I'm going to ask the indulgence of the candidates for me to complete some business items I've forgotten to do as I usually do. One of those is to ask the secretary to read a resolution for the election of the caucus candidates that were nominated at the meeting and are uncontested, and to ask for somebody to approve a motion to accept it and a second. So, Aaron, would you come up? Uh, thank you, Aaron. Thank you for everybody for coming out tonight. Um, before I read this, just a quick note uh, to the candidates. We have signs today, so you'll have a one-minute warning and a 30-second warning. So if you see me holding it up, um, you know, that's just to give you, you know, some basic, uh, you know, idea how much time you have left. For the resolution to cast ballot for the Executive Committee of the People's Caucus of Briarcliff Manor, reads, resolved that the secretary shall be directed to cast one vote for nominees Aaron B. Stern, chair, Larissa Wayne Palmeno, vice chair, Zachary Giampa, treasurer, and Aaron Spring, secretary to serve as the caucus executive committee for one year terms commencing April 1st, 2019. Do we have a motion? Do I announce that it's certified? Can, can, yep. I hereby announce that it has been certified by Secretary Aaron Spring. Thank you. Back to you, Aaron. A little additional housekeeping. Because this meeting is going to run well over two hours and the equipment has a recording limitation of two hours, at some point we're going to take a few minute break to change the memory car, uh, card in the camera and move forward with that. I also have another announcement to make. I want to caution the nominees that there have been some emails which have been sent to the residents of the village that have indicated that parties are the caucus candidates. The caucus election is what selects the caucus candidates. Until that occurs, they're nominees and they do not have the authority of the caucus to utilize the caucus's imprimatur, if you will, or the caucus's logo. So going forward, we hope that the candidates will abide by that request. We thank you for your indulgence. Um, next, we will go to the second candidate making his opening statement. Okay. Thank you. 
I would like to thank the following people, the Executive Committee, Kevin and Steve, my family, Lou Wachtel for superbly pinch hitting for Mayor Sullivan, I'll say that in advance, my trusty colleagues for diligently working as a team for the benefit of all of the 8,000 residents in the six square miles of Briarcliff Manor. Let me be clear, we are running on our record of making Briarcliff better than ever for all. Our top 12 accomplishments are available both electronically and paper formats. It is, in a nutshell, we are providing services and an environment that are the envy of the New York metropolitan area while remaining prudently compliant with New York State tax cap with strong bond ratings. Moreover, long delayed capital projects have been successfully completed for the benefit of all. In addition, our use of resident committees has facilitated both input and transparency as we navigate through difficult land use processes. Finally, our dedication to constituent services, regardless of when the issue originated, helps residents resolve issues without having to resort to litigation. How do we do this? Broad and deep roots in the Briarcliff community, including ourselves, our spouses, and our children. We have all been active in recreation schools and community groups well before we became trustees. Wide-ranging skills arising from our multi-decade business careers. In my case, a 38-year career grounded in finance spending geographies, industries, operational issues, transactions, and capital structures in both good and bad economic times. A bias towards action. We do not let the perfect become the enemy of the good. We take action. A sense of stewardship. We have raised our families here and recognize what a special place the Briarcliff truly is and our duty to protect it for all residents and future generations. Our vision and duty cover all 8,000 residents, all six square miles, and all 40 miles of roads, not just our own streets and neighborhoods. Five, building and leveraging relationships for the benefit of all Briarcliff residents. Four years ago, Mayor Sullivan and I spearhe spearheaded a game plan to repair the then toxic state of relations between the Village of Briarcliff Manor Board and both school systems, the Village of Ostning, Town of Ostning, our state legislators, and our county legislator. I am pleased to report that those efforts have paid off as evidenced by projects such as New York 9A, the backup generator here at the library, community center, and the ADA walkway in Law Park. In addition, the eight to $10 million being spent by Westchester County on Pleasantville Road was also partly due to these efforts. We now have constructive relationships with other government officials, which enables us to get results for the benefit of Briarcliff residents. That's why I could have constructive discussions yesterday with Supervisor Levenberg and Superintendent Sanchez concerning coterminous and B-Zone respectively. They take my calls as I take theirs. That's how we are continuing to make Briarcliff better than ever for all. Thank you. Yes. That's a good suggestion. Uh, we'll ask everybody in the audience to withhold their applause until the end of the session. Um, we're on a tight schedule. It's going to take us close to two and a half hours. So we would appreciate that, that commitment from you. At this point, I also have to make another announcement. The executive committee of the caucus was faced with making a decision whether or not to let Mayor Sullivan submit a written statement to be read by her representative, in this case, Lou Wachtel. And since she was having surgery today, the caucus executive committee made that decision. It apparently is somewhat controversial, but we stand by the decision we've made. We are doing it in fairness, and we hope that the rest of you agree. But if not, that's the best we can do. We're not professionals. We're doing our best, so we thank you for your indulgence. Okay, um, it's time for Lori Sullivan's presentation. Mr. Wachtel, would you come up? Certainly not as attractive. <laughs> but you're younger. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I don't think in anybody here. <laughs> As you just heard, Mayor Sullivan cannot be with us tonight because of a medical issue. It is my pleasure and my honor to read Mayor Sullivan's opening and closing statements this evening. Mayor Sullivan has served the citizens of Briarcliff for the past 10 years with dedication and caring, with one goal in mind, to continue to improve the treasured life we all live in Briarcliff. The following is the opening statement written by Mayor Sullivan. I would like to thank the People's Caucus for carrying on the century-old nonpartisan tradition of our village. 
Also, I would like to thank each of the candidates for our line commitment to volunteer our time, expertise, and yes, energy to our village and put ourselves out there. Thank all of you. As most of you are aware, I very recently was diagnosed with a medical condition that requires immediate treatment. The first step being surgery. While the timing would never have been good, it unfortunately has coincided with the people's course process. For that, I apologize. While it was my original intention to be available to take part in each step of the caucus process, including tonight, unfortunately, the hospital and medical team availability dictated that I have thoracic surgery this morning. My treatment plan post-surgery is to be in the hospital for a few days and then home recuperating. I ask that we all recognize the importance of life and health and respect each other during the election process in our words and our deeds. I have the unique pleasure of being part of the Board of Trustees for the past 10 years, including the last four as your mayor, and hope to be able to continue to give our village one more term. There can be no dispute that our village is great each day and we continue to make it better. I ask that we all look around and see how lucky we are to live in a village that continues every day to give more. Many of our accomplishments of the past four years are in plain sight from the 9A intersection, Baratella's Corner, Law Park Playground, Law Park Pavilion, Community Center Completion, and Central Downtown Business District Rollout Improvement Plan well underway. Many may not be as evident, but equally important from our fully staffed top-rated police department, upgraded fire and ambulance equipment, and rejuvenation of all volunteer departments village debt of millions of dollars while maintaining top quality services and bond ratings and amending our comprehensive plan in accordance with our advisory committee recommendation. This has all been accomplished with resident input and committee dedication with full, open and honest transparency. There are many ongoing projects that I intend to see to completion over the next two years as mayor from continuing the work that we have done and the path we have taken to completing the approved law park, pond repair, expansion of the parking lot plan, moving forward with the Tuttle Road drainage plans, and a, rela and a related resident advisory committee, plan development with our recreation committee and youth center and surrounding area, redevelopment including field acquisition, restrengthening our plan, planning board in anticipation of its lead in the B zone petition process just to name a few. Last week, we have to gavel you out at this point. Boy, I don't talk quick enough. Uh, anybody can call me and I can give you the last paragraph. Thank you, Lou. There's just so much to say about Lou. Lou, thank you very much for stepping up. Oh, sorry. Thank you. All right, Peter, your Thank turn. Thank you, members of the caucus executive committee for arranging tonight's event and special wishes to Lori Sullivan for a speedy recovery. I'm Peter Chatsky. I hope to be the People's Caucus candidate for trustee. As a 25-year resident, I'm aware too often village elections are unchallenged races. Voters face Hobson's choice, no choice at all, of who will lead their community. Tonight, voters have a clear choice to make. Steve Vessio, Ned Midgley, and I offer educational, managerial, practical experience to lead this village. Steve has worked, as you know, on complex municipal projects including roads, sewer, drainage, and parks. Ned has a master's degree in accounting, a Harvard MBA, 22 years as senior VP of one of the largest commercial real estate firms in the world. My MBA in finance, 35 years of running a technology business, and past experience as village mayor round out our qualifications. We offer an ideal mix of real-world skills, experience, and expertise to handle the challenges facing our village. For our opponents, Lori has served 10 years on this board. Mark has sat on the board for six years now, and Brian has put in four years. That's 10 years, six years, four years. Tonight, as you listen to the challenges that still face our village, ask yourself if it's time for a fresh approach. Issues we face today 
are the same issues we have faced for years. Reincorporation as a town, assessment questions, B zone properties, infrastructure maintenance. None of these came out of the blue. Every one of these could have already been addressed by the current mayor and board of trustees adequately and completely. 10 years, six years, four years. Voters should consider the difference between scrambling to keep up with the daily operations of the village and presenting a long range vision to take us into the next generations. I'd push to curb residential development on not only the six corporate campuses that compose the B zone, but also the 40 other large parcels that face the same fate. I'd work to ensure road maintenance was completed quickly with minimum inconvenience to residents. I demand consistent code enforcement throughout the village and ensure large projects consider neighbors from the start of construction to the final sign off for completion. I'd pursue resident friendly changes such as weekend hours at DPW for recycling, food trucks at Law Park for summer poolside service, I will speak quickly, improved technology for reporting potholes, icy roads, litter, inviting all resident eyes to look out for a safe and enjoyable community. I'd openly welcome feedback, consider resident concerns, straightforward goals that should have been implemented over the last four or six or certainly 10 years. It's time for new energy, time for a rededication from our leadership, time for change. I thank you all for listening carefully, thinking about where we are, imagining where we could be, and together I know we can build an even better Briarcliff. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chatsky. We'll move right on to, please hold the applause. They got applause. Move right on. <laughs> Not because it's you. <laughs> I'll be at okay. the end of the opening I'll statement. Be. Please <laughs> applause Peter. He's going to get. I've had so much applause in my life. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay you ready? Ryan, thank let's you, go. Live for it, Peter. I first want to thank everybody for coming out tonight, the People's Caucus. Um, one thing I have noticed, I want to say quickly, um, not enough people know about the People's Caucus. It's a great tradition. I see two, only two young men here, Mr. Zimmerman and Mr. Wasserman, and Mr. Springer as well. Um, <laughs> But we got to get the young people involved, or else it's going to be death to the People's Caucus. I um, want to thank Lori Sullivan for her 10 years. I'm sorry she's not feeling well. She's not able to be here tonight. Um, as far as me, I'm going to tell you what I told you pretty much last time. I am your foot soldier. I'm your boots on your ground. I'm the guy you want to be with in the foxhole. Um, you could depend upon me. I've lived in Briarcliff for 32 years. I'm 59 years old, and for the last 57 years, I've lived in a 10-mile radius. I'm an IT recruiter, owner of a small business for 25 years. Basically, I help people find jobs. Um, it's a great job. I've been able to go to every one of my children's events for the last 26 years, whether it's a sing-along, whether it's a play, um, whether it's a baseball game. They're all grown now. So now my time is devoted to the Village of Briarcliff Manor. Um, I'm a two-term trustee. A member of, I was a member of the Executive Committee of the People's Caucus. I am the liaison to the Recreation Advisory Committee, liaison to the Briarcliff Manor Scarborough Historic Society, liaison to the Briarcliff Manor Fire Department, liaison to the Streetscape Advisory Committee, board member of the Briarcliff Youth Soccer Club, 10-plus year member of the Recreation Advisory Board, assistant director of ASO Way Back. Previous board member of the Barcliff Manor WYSL. I coach soccer, Little League, baseball, basketball. I even played basketball at fundraisers for the Rotary Club against the Harlem Wizards. You might have seen me making shots out there. My wife, Rory, we've been married for 35 years and been together for 41 years. Uh, she started as a volunteer in the library uh, in the late 80s, part-time in the library. She was asked to work in the village office. She's worked as a clerk, finance department, and for the last 17 years, she's been your court clerk. I'm very lucky to have her. She's a wonderful wife. I have three children and a wonderful uh, daughter-in-law, uh, Jacqueline Geosha Zerman, and a grandson on the way. My son married into another wonderful Briarcliff family, the Geoshes. Mike was on the zoning board, and Clarissa's on the executive committee of the People's Caucus. What I'm saying to you tonight is the Zermans are a big part of the fabric of the Briarcliff Manor community. Let me be clear, I wish all the, the candidates good luck this evening, and on January 24th, I will wake up and be the same person that I was before the election. I will fully support the winner of the caucus election. I do not want to dishonor or discredit 
the caucus system. So I will keep everything this evening on a positive note. Thank you very much. Ed Thank you, Mr. Zerman. Perfect time. Give my extra time to Ned, please. No, that's all right. <laughs> hey, can I finish my speech? <laughs> Mr. I Midgley, it's your turn. <laughs> Aaron, you can start the timer. Right? <laughs> and so Peter's a hat, just so you know. <laughs> when he was made. Good, good evening, everybody. My name is Ned Midgley. Um, I've lived in the villa, in and around Briarcliff for the last 55 years. And the last 21 years in Briarcliff, uh, on the river side of the town and in the Osking School District. I think it's important that I mention that early on because there are two members of our, of our slate of uh, Peter and Steve and myself who actually live on the Osting side of town. The current board has no one who, uh, in the Osting School District. And I think it's important out there because we have a very unique challenge as a village because we have two school districts with two different sets of problems, and they need to be considered. Um, more on that later. I only have uh, three minutes. Uh, Peter was very gracious in uh, talking about my bio, and I don't feel I need to repeat it. But let me just stress that one of the things I think I'm bringing to the board in this time of you know, sort of real estate mayhem in Briarcliff is I have 22 years of experience in real estate. I've dealt with some of the brightest, um, <laughs> most tenacious, um, and, and, uh, and, and, and aggressive real estate people. And I know how to, I know the industry, I know the business, and I know how to negotiate. It's one of the things that I think this village has lacked for the last several years. Um, you know, today we really stand at a crossroads um, in the sense that we have a unique opportunity to choose what Briar Cliff is going to look like in 20 years. Um, we currently have five B zones, um, which some of the planning has, has said that they might in entertain uh, housing or other uses, including the self storage facility in a residential neighborhood. Um, thank you. And I, I think some additional thoughts need to, uh, thoughts need to be taken on that, uh, it, to think this through in terms of the character. Uh, additionally, uh, to the five, pro the five B zones property, Pace University is coming up for sale right now. Colliers is taking it out. Um, and we're there, as Peter mentioned, there's several other parcels of property that can apply to become B zones which would allow the same zoning on those properties. So the seven to 800 units that are potentially, that could be built in the B zones, could be significantly more having huge negative impacts on the community. You'll hear more about this in the debate, and I also extend my best wishes to Lori, and I hope all of you will consider Peter, Steve, and myself. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Midgley, and thank you for being on time as well. <coughs> yeah, doing good. All right, we're at the stage where we're going to start with the question and answer session. Once again, we are going to start left to right. Each person gets two minutes to answer the same question. The debate part of the format will be each person will get one minute to respond to add something to their question response or to respond to a comment made by the other candidates. After the first question, we will alternate, then moving from right to left, and the candidates drew the positions that they're sitting in tonight. So here we go. The first question, and these questions, for the most part, were prepared by the executive committee. They're repeats of questions that have been used in prior years as well. And here we go. The village board has considered taking action to become a coterminous town village. Do you support such action? And if so, what benefits do you anticipate may be realized by village residents, and how long is it expected to take? Mr. Vessio? Thank you. <clears throat> I don't think anyone up here is going to talk against the town village concept. Questions. We're alternating questions. The opening. Can, can I get my time back? Closing statements. Yes. Yeah, I'll, I'll restart. Come on. That's okay. Ready? Whenever you're ready. Okay. 
I don't think anyone up here is going to dispute the fact that we should become a town village. There's uh, several others in the area, including Mount Kisco, who are a town village. The town provides an additional layer of government cost to all of us as village taxpayers. It provides, in return, little to no benefit to us. Uh, they do our assessment, which is very kind of them. Uh, I'm sure we'd be happy to take that back. Uh, they do provide some parks that we can go use, but other than that, they do not provide much. Uh, the village provides the bulk of the services you see, DPW and fire, police, recreation. That's where we need to focus our efforts on. About 10 percent of your bill is the town tax bill. If, we could, if everybody could save 10 percent, I think everybody would be happy about that. Uh, those are some of the, uh, the benefits. How long is it expected to take? Uh, there's, only, there's four ways you can become a town village, according to New York State. Two of them are not going to apply to us. Any of the paths will take, I would imagine, more than a year. However, if we don't start the process, it will never happen. We need to start the process. We need to get the ball rolling, or we'll be sitting here five years from now talking about the same thing. We're in time. Got 45 seconds. Very good. <clears throat> next. Take the next one. Oh, sure. Um, absolutely, we should become a coterminous town village. Uh, and this is where the relationships help. I've had these discussions with both uh, Mayor Garrity and uh, Supervisor Levenberg for the past two years. Uh, one of the challenges in all this uh, is that uh, they're on the other side of the coin. So although for us it will save us the 70 cents per thousand that we now pay, which is roughly what it is, it will save about two-thirds because it will cost about one-third on a runway basis to put in. You will save two-thirds of your town tax, one-third in the village to do the assessment function, roughly. We calculated it a couple of years ago. Uh, th there is some one-time costs that we'll have to go through. This is going to be a nano-Brexit. It's not going to be easy because on the flip side, the Austin people would rather have three entities into one than three entities into two separate towns. So for example, when you look at the ratio right now of the 37,000 people in the town of uh, Austin, we're about seven. There's another thousand in Mount Pleasant. The uh, 25 in the village of Austin, five in the town outside. And so we pay for the general town tax, about 40 percent or more of the taxes, the 20 percent of the people. If you mush it all together, then we would be paying 45 percent for 38,000 people, which doesn't make sense, and we would have uh, our services deteriorate, our infrastructure overwhelmed with a uh, volume of people. So we have to make sure that we go into two different towns, and that's going to take working with our elected officials to get it through Albany and to get everyone to sign off. And it's going to take a while, and there's going to be some one-time costs to Brexit out of it. Thank you very much. Mr. Chatsky, your turn. Um, like everyone else, I, I agree this is something certainly worth further exploration. Um, as it's been said, ultimately this decision is going to be for voters, since really the only practical me uh, measure here is uh, to petition, and that would have to be done by a majority of, or at least 5 percent of the town voters um, based on the last election. The thing I'm struck by here is um, I was unaware of any conversations Mark claims he's had. There hasn't been anything on any agenda item. And I know that in 2015, um, at the organizational meeting, Mark promised this would be complete in 2020. He called it, in fact, quote, self-evident. Um, I, I assume the board thought this would just happen by autopilot, because as a village, we've seen very little take place to make this happen. Mark. Uh, was in charge of tax savings and efficiencies, this, as most people have reported, would be a major component to cut down an excess layer of tax that we're really not, as a village, getting much benefit from at all. I don't think anybody would miss the um, rec department offerings of the town, since we have ample offerings right here in the village, and certainly no one wants to pay any extra in tax uh, and not get anything for it. So I, I'm definitely in favor, as I think everyone here is, of further exploration of this. But it has to happen. It has to be launched. Someone has to take the first steps. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chatsky. Mr. Zerman. Well, I guess as it comes down, there's less and less to say, so we could say it much quicker. But yes, I agree. Um, but a couple of things need to be noted. It's not as easy as just going out and doing it. Briarcliff would have to be a village town. But also, Osning would have to be a village town. 
So we would have to actually vote to get out. Um, in the past, you know, we spoke about 1720 coming over here. It's not very likely that they are going to come over. They wanted to um, join us when their services were cut, when their police was cut, uh, and get our services from here. But they decided that once the police from Austin covered their services that they no longer wanted to join Briarcliff. So we would really have to make the effort to do it. It would probably take more than a year. It's a, it's a long process, but yes, I am definitely in favor of coterminous. Thank you very much, Mr. Zerman. Mr. Midgley? Well, this may be a record. It's unanimous. We actually all support the same thing. Uh, it's interesting, you know, I've, I've read up on this in the, in the last month, and I think the largest impact, everyone's talked about potential tax savings. I think that's something that certainly should be investigated just for that. But also getting the tax assessment back into the village of Briarcliff may give us the chance to eliminate some inequities that are potentially uh, in the system with the town of Austin taxing the village of Briarcliff and the town of Austin and the village of Austin perhaps differently. We would then own our own assessment process, which I think is a valuable thing. Uh, and I think that at one point the village had it and gave it up as a cost saving measure, which may have been, um, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't there, so I, I won't comment. Um, you know, the, the other impor important thing to say is, you know, Peter talked about Mark's, uh, you know, uh, we have a quote from him saying that in five years, in 2020, we will be coterminous and Austin will be coterminous. I think that will happen. It's self-evident. That's the quote. Importantly, the, the first step to doing this is the petition. It hasn't been done. It's five years later. It hasn't been done. It hasn't been started. So as opposed to saying, it's hard, it's difficult to get done. Maybe we should take the first step and learn how hard it is. Thank you very much, Mr. Midgley. Okay. Thank you. Got you all. I told you I make mistakes. I'll get it right one day. All right, um, Mr. Vessio, you do have a minute to either add to your response or to rebut any others? Uh, I mean, most of what you can say about Coterminous Town Village was said, but Brian brought up 1720, which I think is a good point. Uh, the B zone is going to be talked about. I'm sure there'll be a question on that, but that's a big portion of our commercial tax base. We're zoned 95 percent residentially here in Briarcliff. 17 and 20, especially the North State Road section, is mostly commercial. If that could become part of our village, I think it would be very helpful to our tax situation. I also feel if we pursue the Coterminous Town Village, that annexation will be more likely to happen. Uh, they are geographically adjacent to us, and it's almost a natural progression that they would become part of Briarcliff. It operates as part of Briarcliff as it is now. It's just a matter of paperwork. Again, we have to get the ball started. We have to get things in motion. Otherwise, we're just going to be sitting here years from now in the same situation. Thank you, Mr. Vesino. Mr. Wilson, your turn. Sure, a couple of quick points. Um, Coterminous is an objective. Uh, it does require working with the adjoining municipalities who we were working very cooperatively with in doing the 9A intersection and a few other projects. So, uh, and plus, any sort of uh, move by the town outside to join us, which they're allowed to do via the petition process, 1720 was an example, will set in motion conflicts within the political system in terms of getting this approved and getting it done. So what we want to do is actually have it where it can work and get to the end game. And yes, it may not get done by 2020. It might get done by 1021 or 1022, rather 2022, I should say. But again, you can talk about it, but to actually get it done, which you've gotten things done before, you have to work with your local officials. It has to go through Albany. It needs to be approved. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. By the way, 1022 would have been the time of the Templars. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, Mr. Chatsky? We were almost in perfect agreement until the 1720 issue came up. Um, I actually disagree with Brian that 1720 would be problematic, and I guess Mark also I disagree with. Um, it, right now, we provide fire, water, DPW services would be far more efficient 
we did a study on this that uh, was available, I think, to the board, showing that DPW would actually be more efficient in their routes, thereby saving uh, a good chunk of money for both 1720 and the current village. So I'm not sure this is something that would be just poo-pooed by 1720. I think they'd be very interested. I think we can make that happen. I think everybody could win, and I, I think it's certainly worth starting which is the only thing you and I, I think, have disagreed about. I don't think that the current board has taken the steps to start this process as effectively as should have been done. Thank you, Mr. Chatsky. Brian? Well, let's talk about 1720. Um, they did ask us to come over. They have to vote. We can't bring them over no matter what we want. They uh, happened when I was first getting on the board that it ended. We were paying taxes to Austin that was fighting us. We were paying taxes to Bark of trying to bring them over. We were paying double, um, and it wasn't our choice. It was their choice. We were just helping them get the vote. And they decided they pulled it once they got a police department and decided they were going to stay where they were. I'm done. Thank you, Mr. Zimmerman. Mr. Midgley, your turn. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> I'm a little stubborn. You know, I'll, I'll remember next time. Again, a lot has been said about the uh, coterminous town. Again, I think, you know, a long journey starts with the first step. Uh, but I also want to disagree with Mark. Uh, he said that this has to go to Albany. According to the Article 5 peti uh, petition that's in this legal memorandum that I have in front of me, you only have to go to the county with the petition. The county makes a the decision. There is no state involvement. Thank you, Mr. Midgley. All right, um, we're going to move on to a question that seems to be the center of this election, uh, the B zones and other properties and the development of other properties in the village. There are at least six audience questions from that, as well as the one that the executive committee prepared, all with slightly different takes. So I'm going to try and, on my feet, read the original question and supplement it with pieces of the other questions. What is your thinking with regard to future development of properties in the village? Please comment on your views specifically related to the B zone properties as well as the former Pace campus. Um, another question related to it coming from the audience members, the village planning consultants BFJ appear to have had a conflict of interest in representing the Pace property. Is that correct as you wrote the question? I think Phillips. Uh, no. Phillips, sorry. And uh, that uh, makes uh, questioners wonder what can be done about conflicts like that and was, was that known to the village uh, board when they were asked to provide their assessment of how to amend the comprehensive plan. So that's question number two now. I hope you were able to take it down because I doubt I'll be able to repeat it. And Mr. Midgley, it's your turn first. Thank you. It sounds like there's several questions nested in there, so I'll, I'll start. Uh, first, with, regret, with regard to the conflict of interest of the uh, consulting firm, I can't comment. I wasn't on the board. I didn't make the decision, nor was I in the room. Um, secondly, as, as, as opposed to the B zones, look, this is a this is a sensitive topic for our entire village. Uh, we have two school districts that have diff potentially differing goals, which may allow for different developments in different parts of the village. Um, to comment on what those are or what those may be at this point. I think is really premature because we haven't, you know, because you, you really don't want to tip your hand at a negotiation and give, and give the developer the upper hand. You don't want to give them anything before the negotiation begins. So one of the things that I think our entire team uh, has proposed is that we would put a one year more, at least a one year moratorium on any uh, proposed changes to the B zones so we can develop a consensus in the community as to, re you know, because I talked earlier about that we're sitting at a crossroads. We need, need, we need to make a choice about the next 20 years. 
and we only have one chance to do it right and one chance to do it wrong. Thank you, Mr. Midgley. Brian, your turn. First of all, the uh, amendments made to the master plan. Uh, what I have right here is the B Zone Advisory Committee report. Um, I've read it, I've slept with it, I've eaten it. Um, Steve Vesio did a great job, and you know, he was ahead of it, and that's what we used their recommendations to make uh, the changes. Um, as far as the B Zone properties in general, we've decided to look at each property individually. Um, really, when you look at it, um, the process to look at these B Zone properties would not be much different whether we amended the plan or not. If we did not amend the plan, the owners still have the right to come and ask us to change the zoning. Uh, we are going to look at each individual property. We've already looked at, um, it was suggested in the plan that self-storage should be considered at the Sony. The board looked at the plan and said that was not appropriate. And we made a resolution to deny it. And once they saw we were serious, the developers got it. Developers pulled their petition. We will stand strong. We will not let 700 units come into the village. That's ridiculous. But that's all I have to say. Go right ahead, Pete. Mr. Chatsky, your turn. Thank you. Um, first, I'd like to just note that I have a long history of advocating for controlled development in this village. There's no question we can do a lot more here. Despite uh, their claims, I see no public evidence that the current BOT has permanently tabled proposed legislation. Lori has mentioned this a couple of times. That legislation would be problematic here. They proposed changes. They paid outside counsel to draft. It would allow any property larger than nine acres to be converted to a B zone. So we're not just, and, and B zones get generous density bonuses, <coughs> excuse me, for residential building. Thus we take a current problem that is currently impacting only six properties in the village and we're expanding it where it could affect more than 40. I would immediately eliminate that potential loophole. We need height restrictions on buildings. We need far better control of light pollution, which is a major irritant to people living, not just immediately near some of these developments, but <clears throat> way further away. Um, look at the club as an example. I would like to strengthen and empower the powers of the Architectural Review Board. I'd bring back the functions of the Con Conservation Advisory Council to protect village and natural resources, and I would require much more aggressive notification of, uh, to residents when any development of a property is proposed, requiring developers to pay for the costs of ongoing notification to neighbors whenever changes to site plans are made or proposed. Thank you, Mr. Chatsky. Mr. Wilson? Sure. Um, look, step back for a second. There's always going to be tensions in any community when you look at the overall view for the village versus the neighbors. Vacant buildings strewn throughout the village, deteriorating over time and eventually paying no taxes, are not good for the characteristic of this village. That said, of course, rampant development is bad too. So the challenge is to find what's appropriate for these various parcels. And having them empty for 10, 20 years, I don't think anyone, except for, for perhaps somebody who lives right next door, thinks that's a good idea aesthetically or as a taxpayer. That said, again, some of these properties are very different. Some have a lot of open space, and we would want to preserve them. And again, let me tell you, the process works. So what we did, the amending of the master plan based on the B zone, which I was on, is chock full of good recommendations. As Brian said, we put the 5,000 foot recommendations in with public hearings and then went on to go to a petition by petition process. And as we sit here today, the B zones have, zoning has not changed. Not one iota has changed. The 700 units, you know, is, was dead and buried that silly draft seven months ago. And the reality is we've had two petitions filed, the process works, we've had hearings, and there's a lot of angst if you live near them, but it works. And so where we are is moving forward step by step, and we want to bolster the planning board, which is some members have said they might be overworked. That's where the action's going to be on these. And that's why we also want to have the Conservation Advisory Council involved on the aesthetic side and the nature side. So this is the right way to handle it over time, and the process is now working. Thank you. Mr. Vessio, your turn. 
Thank you. Uh, I agree. We need a moratorium in place. We need to uh, protect the residents. We need to put in place measures that will prevent the village from being overburdened. Just to clarify, I did not support any specific use on any specific property. That was not the task of the B Zone Advisory Committee. It was to analyze any and all uses that were out there. The amendment that was made to the master plan was allowing all uses right up to high density residential. The, what we had discussed during those meetings was throttling it. Instead of a single tenant use only on these properties, allow multi tenant use as of right instead of special use permit. Maybe allow some medical office, a little bit. Instead, we went all the way. Uh, the other recommendations, which were really the important ones, were highlighted again in a letter by the B Zone Committee sent November 14th. Still unresponded to. Those recommendations included reducing the building height from the current 60 foot, uh, requiring screening plans to be submitted, requiring a recreational fee for the creation of a living unit. None of those have been implemented. The statement that the 700 unit law is, quote, dead and killed seven months ago is patently false. As a matter of fact, the agreement with BFJ for $100,000 to draft the zoning text amendments for the BNBT was executed June 20th. It has not been canceled. It is still in effect, and money has been spent on it. Your money has been sent to draft this law. This is available on the website, on the village website. It's in draft form, yes. But there's a time frame here and a schedule to implement it that everybody can see online. This was supposed to be implemented by April. Thankfully, we stopped it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vessio. We will now go with responses or additions to your prior response, again, starting with Mr. Midgley. Thank you. I heard, I heard a comment that, that said there's, there's angst if you n live near one of these development sites or potential development sites. I think there should be angst in the village, not just if you're a neighbor. And just to say, you know, because you live next door to a site, you know, you're, full, you know, you're a NIMBY person. I, I think that's really ridiculous. Um, but a couple things. I've talked to a number of people over the last several weeks. These are simple, practical things, and I'm going to try and do it in 30 seconds. We need better notice. The developer has to pay for it, and everyone within a certain radius has to know about it. We need strengthened noise ordinance. So $150 fine for making too much noise on a construction site doesn't deter anyone. A $5,000 fine might. Uh, improve, improve requirements for visual noise and light screening. Why don't we have impact fees? I'll stop. Thank you, Mr. Midgley, Mr. Zerman. Okay, um, as far as the process, let's talk about the process. I look around here, I see a lot of people uh, from the River Road area, from the Sony area. Um, we did something a little bit different. We had a informal presentation at a um, work session. We televised it. That alerted everybody in the community. The next meeting, this place was packed. Everybody had a chance to say their opinion. The board listened, and we were going to pull the petition. And as far as the club, you know, we learned a lot from the club. Mr. Yeager and Maureen have uh, informed us of quite a bit of things that we've learned. That started a long time before this, I was on the board, a long time before Mark was on the board, and even probably before Lori was on the board. So we uh, have tried to uh, work through that as well. And yes, I agree that some of these things have to be worked out. Am I good? Thank you, Mr. Zerman. Mr. Chatsky. Two points. Um, Steve mentioned that the problem with the club particularly seems to be that what is there now is not what was planned to be there now. So it's a, it's a major asterisk what's happening in terms of code enforcement in this village. And I, I think residents deserve to know what's going on with that. The second thing, which I've noticed nobody responded to, BFJ, the village planning consultant, was also hired by Phillips one of the largest properties to be affected by changes in this planning. They were working both sides of the deal here, and uh, I don't know how that process, how that occurred. Um, in my business, I know anytime I hire a lawyer for anything, there is a conflict letter that uh, gets disclosed. It, it's a pretty readily open standard part of business to make sure that the people you're dealing with are not also working on the other side. So uh, I would like to know what happened with that. 
Thank you, Mr. Chatsky. Mr. Wilson. Sure. Uh, real quick on the BFJ issue. First, I've heard of it. Um, Phil's back there. We'll take a look at it tomorrow morning. I mean, obviously, it could be a, poten a big potential problem. Second, uh, with respect to uh, the B-Zone Committee, which had a lot of good recommendations, I disagree with Mr. Vessio. If you compare the two documents, you'll see that we took over a lot of the 11 bullet point recommendations. In fact, the Board further restricted some of them to state and local roads. Uh, lastly, um, you know, it's ironic. Um, I don't know how many people here talked to the other uh, municipal officials uh, or school superintendent uh, Sanchez. I mean, I do. And actually, in speaking with him, He's disappointed that there is no self-storage there, uh, although I don't think there should be, because he, he wants the tax revenue and no children. Of course, he's very concerned about Old Briarcliff Road, and I've assured him that on our end, we're looking to minimize any school impact of any of these developments in the B zone, and anything would be financially accretive to the Austin school system, in other words, the taxes versus any small number of kids. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. And again, Mr. Vessio. Sure. Just so you know, there's 22 bullet recommendations in the report. Uh, 11 were not instituted, and you did in your proposed legislation uh, limit things. What was limited was high-density residential, the R30M zone, which is the Orchard Road Apartments. It would be allowed on all state and county roads, so that would be all of the B zone properties. And it would also be allowed, it would, except for Phillips, it would also be allowed on Old Briarcliff because it adjoins an R30M. And on Phillips, we're going to give them the highest adjoining density. That's what this... BBT zoning amendment says. Nobody mentioned PACE. I'll just say this quickly in my last 10 seconds because there's people here who live around there. PACE is a special use permit with an underlying residential zone. It's not a B zone property. It's a special use permit. If they change their use, they have to come back. It's a residential zone. So that is different than these other properties. Thank you, Mr. Vessio. Um, some of the questions that have been submitted by members of the audience were actually addressed by the candidates who are sitting here at the dais uh, on the Conservation Advisory Committee, et cetera. So I'm not going to use those. Uh, but I have one here that I think is a better question than uh, some of the ones we prepared. So I'm going to bring it in without reading the whole thing, because as you can see, it takes up a better part of a page. So it has a two-part question. The rest is set up. Uh, and this comes from Bruce Yeager. Um, he says he's not here to elaborate on sins of the past, but we'll ask each of you if you will pledge to use the full power of the position you're running for to ensure that the club conforms with all applicable plans, regulations, and approvals, direct or implied, especially as regards any screening requirements. Two upon taking office to immediately revisit the village's noise ordinance with the intent of segregating the noise ordinance to distinguish the difference between single-family residential construction and projects such as the club. Thank you for the question. We start from the left again, Steve. Thank you. Okay. Thank you for that question, Mr. Yeager. Uh, yes, I do pledge to help enforce what was approved if we don't enforce what was approved, it's a construction free-for-all, which is what has happened up there. Mature trees that would provide some screening, not for Mr. Yeager, unfortunately, but for the other residents, were removed. And there's many other things that were done, done not according to the plan. This doesn't just apply to this project. It applies to any large project that occurs in this village. And we have several petitions that came in already on the B zone. The noise ordinance was recently revised. However, I think it can be a lot better. We need to differentiate between the homeowners trying to do work on their property on a Saturday and large developments. There's many ways that we can do that, but it's something that, that's critical that we have to do. Uh, I will look at the noise ordinance, and I will look at these other projects. And any project, whether it's a development or a street and road project, would have a process that would include a substantial completion inspection, like you do on any construction contract. The plans are compared, but we wouldn't let it get to that point. We would be on them from day one with inspectors at their cost to ensure compliance, and we would enforce the conditions of the resolution. Part of the problem with the club is it was first proposed in 1999, passed in 2003, with about 10 or 12 iterations thereafter. 
And some of the conditions in the resolution, maybe people haven't read them, I recently did, uh, there's a lot of good stuff in there that can, that can help the affected residents. The village dropped the ball on the screening on that lower side. They did. We have to find a way to fix it. Thank you, Mr. Vessio. Mr. Wilson? Sure. A couple of uh, items uh, with respect to the club, uh, since I've had to deal with it for about the past two years working with Mr. Yeager and some of the residents. Uh, you know, look, the, uh, every board does the best they can uh, in the past, and unfortunately we found out there were a lot of shortcomings uh, when uh, construction started two years ago. And so we've done our best not to throw blame at people, but to go and fix it. So that's what I've been doing on behalf of the residents. In some cases, the screening that was approved is only good for six months a year, so we're trying to fix some of that. In some cases, the screening for the people who uh, have the driveway up against their property, uh, that screening is technically not supposed to go until the whole project's done, including the lower level. So what we're trying to do is accelerate that by a couple of years, because now it turns out the lower level is going to maybe years away. Uh, so I think everyone has tried in their best faith to handle this properly, but we're working with some original ar arrangements that were probably, in retrospect, deficient. And so my job uh, in constituent service is to do the best I can to help fix that in accordance with the law and in accordance with the agreement. Now, shifting gears over to the noise, we did put that in. And again, because of the hell that all the people went through in their uh, Utah open pit mine with these rock crushes, it was ridiculous. It was permitted. And so we fixed that in the law, and meanwhile, during the construction, we worked with the developer to voluntarily cut those back. So again, our job is to do the best we can in new laws and new regulations going forward. It's also to remediate things that come up, up that no one knew about, despite their best faith efforts. And that's what we do, and that's, that's what this job is. So, um, and if there's an enforcement issue, uh, to my knowledge, we have enforced, and we push our people to do better. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. Mr. Chatsky. I totally take the pledge. <laughs> Let me start with that. Um, I, the village, I, I think it has been a disaster in terms of um, making sure that, why are you waving? Too, sorry. I think it's been a disaster in terms of making sure that the plans that were approved for the club, including the rollout and the implementation have been followed. I think it's been a nightmare. Um, I actually read up on what I think is the last version of the planning board approval for the club. There was a line that said there will be, and I'm bare, just about quoting, no additional light impact from that construction. If you look at that building, that's not even close. There must be 400 windows that you can see from all over the village. It's, it, in my mind, a travesty. We have in the past in this village required large developers sometimes to pay for an on-site inspector throughout the entire process um, that the village hires and the developer reimburses for. We did this with the development of Trump, for example. I, there's no reason that a project the size of the club shouldn't be commissioned, uh, uh, subject to the same thing. The noise ordinance, let me just uh, mention that, I was very involved with that ordinance. I came to the meetings. It was a disaster of an ordinance. It was draft was held was presented to the community that in theory this board had reviewed. There were typos, there were spelling errors, there were words omitted that changed the meaning, the legal meaning of paragraphs. That's not the way you roll out a noise ordinance. Worst of all, that specific noise ordinance grandfathered in uh, anything that had shovels in the ground. It was developed, yes, specifically because neighbors of the club were complaining about blasting, but by its own language, it omitted the club from being held responsible to that noise ordinance. That is a failure of leadership. That is not the way the Board of Trustees should be addressing a problem. A carve out for a large developer, which is the source of the very problem you're trying to solve, doesn't make any sense. Thank you, Mr. Chatsky. Mr. Zerman. Well, first, I apologize to Bruce and Maureen Yeager for all the, and any of the other neighbors who've had to go through this. Um, again, you are absolutely correct. I pledge as well. Uh, Mark has been working with you and Kevin um, to try to mediate the effects. And is really, um, we, we did address the noise ordinance. We tried to work with them. Um, and I, I can't say anything uh, other than that, I'm very sorry that you guys have had these problems. Um, this plans went through 
before I was on the board, and we kind of got it. And um, mm. I can't apologize enough. You are correct. Mr. Midgley, your turn. I'll take the pledge as well. That's a, that was a pretty simple thing to do. Um, and I also think what you, you got a chance in hearing, it, you know, just over this last issue, you know, with Steve's background in heavy construction, with, you know, with Peter's background on the board and my background in real estate, these are issues that we would have anticipated had we been involved. Um, you know, just little things like on a construction site, having an inspector that, you know, that the, that the developer pays for and reports to the village. I mean, these are common sense things, which is what really has me, to go back to the previous issue for a second, if we can't manage the biggest construction project that Briarcliff is probably likely to see, what's going to happen in all these other five or six if they ever come up, even if they're right-sized or done to scale and character with the neighborhood? So, you know, there's a management issue here that I, I that is part of the reason that I think you know, we have to develop the, the, the expertise and, and the management uh, tools necessary to, to monitor these potential construction and development sites. And I think that's where the moratorium comes in and not letting, you know, until we know what we're doing, we shouldn't be doing things. And, you know, I apologize for your situation. Um, again, I wasn't here, so I you know, I wasn't involved, but it's, thank you. Um, but one of the things that, you know, that it points, it, it, you were let down by the village, you had one developer for essentially 20 years, and you probably had six, eight, ten board members, you know, over that time. And, you know, institutional knowledge and continuity, I think our team brings to the table and hopefully some new energy. Thank you, Mr. Midgley. Mr. Vessio, you have one minute to response. Thank you. Uh, section, suggestion on the um, work hours. We can make that part of any site plan approval for any large project. We can mandate as part of approval your work hours will be Monday to Friday from 8 to 5. Very simple solution. Nobody wants to hear construction on the weekends. Saturdays and Sundays are our days to enjoy our properties, our backyards, and de-stress from our work life. Uh, the lighting plan that was submitted, I'm glad uh, Peter mentioned that, showed that there would be no light penetration on any other property. So I'm not sure what's happening up there that there's now light penetration onto neighboring properties. It sounds like non-compliance. Non um, it's a little frustrating that this is being dealt with two years after the fact. Uh, I, th I think that if we have any large projects, we should also have a community liaison. And even projects throughout the village, we could have a community liaison. A point of contact for residents where they can get informed. If they have a concern, they can call this person or email them, and they'll get back to them. I think that would be a good idea. Thank you, Mr. Vessio. Mr. Wilson? Sure. Um, with respect to the pledge, I mean, I've been living the pledge for about nine months, so of course I can take it, uh, working with the residents. Uh, again, uh, I think what we've learned from this project uh, is that, uh, you know, you cannot socialize all the benefits to the whole village and penalize, I'm good, penalize the uh, That's few of the neighbors. The key thing, the key thing is that we have the approvals and designs correctly up front. And with respect to engineering, I have a clock. With respect to the engineering, I believe, I believe that we do have uh, engineers off? paid for by the contractors who go and inspect it. I mean, Phil's back there. He can confirm that. The issue, though, is that there's probably not a full-time one there. Uh, but, of course, that can be put in the agreements. But, again, we live with what was already done. And our next bite at the apple is uh, when they... Uh, Next bite at the apple is when they go for a new building permit, and uh, there will be that. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. We apologize for the interruptions. No Mr. Chatsky? Well, it's true you have to live with whatever you inherit that came prior to you, but the problem is as soon as a resident points out an issue, any kind of impact um, or something like light impact, which is clearly in violation, I think the village has options. They can go in. They can stop the entire thing. They can, they can put in a cease order and, and just hold up all development, it's an awesome negotiating opportunity to get things done properly. And those are the kinds of things I think you need. That is when you need the village to be aggressive on your behalf. And it's not just immediate neighbors. This impacts, I think, anybody, especially light and noise. Thank you, Mr. Chatsky. Mr. Zerman. 
Well, unfortunately, the lessons that we have learned through the club will be lessons that we are able to put forth going forward with other planning. Again, um, this started in 1999. This has been a long process. It's just come to fruition lately. So I understand. And again, we will make changes there, and uh, we will uh, improve the process going forward. Thank you, Mr. Zerman. Mr. Midgley. In, a previ in one of my pre previous statements, uh, and when the clock ran out, I had mentioned something about impact fees. Other places around the country uh, do, in fact, impose impact fees when a new housing unit is developed in a community to pay for those services that may, ha may need to be expanded or, uh, and to help out the community uh, and the developer pays that. I think Briarcliff probably should be thinking about something like this. I've seen impact fees as high as $25,000 across the country. And that money is given to the town or the village, in, in this case, uh, to help provide for services. That may also give the, uh, the town some, uh, uh, or the village, uh, some additional uh, monies to work with to, to help some of the residents who have been disadvantaged. Thank you, Mr. Midgley. Now I'm going to substitute another question that's asked by a member of the audience. And this is asked by Joan Austin, and it's been a question that has come up at every one of the caucus meetings in the eight years that I've served on the executive committee. In December of 2008, a committee was formed to look into improvements at Scarborough Park. The committee met regularly and presented a report with suggested improvement in November of 2009. Since that time, nothing has been done to improve or even adequately maintain this beautiful, unique, and rapidly deteriorating parcel, parcel of land. The response that's usually given is we're looking for grant money, but nothing has happened. I would like to ask each of the candidates if they would support work on Scarborough Park and would they be willing to dedicate village funds to this effort? Mr. Midgley, you're first. Yep. Well, I know Scarborough Park well. Um, I you know, take the train into the city every day, and I actually used, I, I had taken my son's fishing there at once. Um, but obviously I'm not a fisherman. But, um, Yes, it, it, you can, if you walk through the park, you can see in some places it's deteriorating, so it's some of the topsoil is being lost. Um, and we have a beautiful plan here. Um, I actually have a copy of the Scarborough Park concept plan that was developed by New York State for nothing, given to us. And it hasn't been acted on. Um, what I can tell you uh, with certainty is that I've looked at the financials of the village and nothing's going to happen there because in the 2018 to 2024 capital budgeting, there is a number in there for parks, all parks. You know what that number is? Zero. That's what your current board and your current mayor have budgeted for parks through 2014. Zero. I think that's 2024. 2024. I'm sorry, I've talked. Oh, okay. um, I I th I think with some study that some monies should be made available for the parks, and particularly Scarborough Park is an interesting example in that what you don't want to do is have it waste away because once you start losing topsoil and, and erosion there, you start getting into very expensive repairs and you have to get involved with multiple agencies because of the riverine environment and, you know, and, and you know, f frankly, a lot of the, the wildlife that's in the water there. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Midgley. Brian, Mr. Zerman. Uh, I would support it 110%. I am 110% behind all the parks. It is an asset. We are one of the few river towns that do not have a park. Um, it is a priceless piece of property that needs to be redeveloped. Um, it is small. It is complicated because of New York State, but yes, 
we should develop that property. We don't even have benches there. I go there um, on a regular basis when I pick up my daughter from the train, bring my newspaper. Unfortunately, I've got to bring my own chair. Um, it is a beautiful piece of property, and I would fully uh, try to develop it. Thank you, Mr. Zerman. Mr. Chatsky, your turn. Brian's reading my notes, and it's not fair. <laughs> um, first of all, <laughs> I'm just that smart. <laughs> I would suggest, uh, I think the bench is a good idea. I have one in my name just around the corner, happy to move it over to that part. Um, I, I know that uh, our team, the three of us, sat down today and actually looked at that 2009 report, so nice timely question for us. Totally agree that Scarborough Park could be a gem of the village. We're one, as Brian mentioned, one of the few river towns that has done nothing to enhance that asset. It is not straightforward, it's a little tricky. Development on the Hudson is subject not only to New York state law, but actually federal law. So it's a bit of a process, but like so many things in this village, you have to start it to get anywhere, and I look forward to doing that. Years ago, I looked into doing some smaller things that we could do right away. Launching kayaking from there uh, was something I looked into. A leading company in the area, was just in the process of deals, I'm going to talk fast, with Phillips Manor and I think Peekskill, so that sort of got put on hold, but now I'm noticing that kayaking is dotting most of the river towns, I'm sure that's something we could add. Um, I'd welcome a chance to explore other options, I'd like to organize, for example, community picnics there. It's an awesome spot, and unless you hold events and bring people there, I don't think everyone knows about it unless they commute regularly. We'd offer tickets to ensure it's not overcrowded because it's only six acres, kind of small. Um, could be a great weekend fishing spot, although I don't know what you'd be catching in the Hudson, but Strike it's more, more of a sport than you know a way to eat dinner. Um, in my caucus speech just a week ago, I specifically mentioned making the village even more fun for families, and I think this is an example where we can do things at pretty low cost, pretty little effort, and really make a difference. Thank you, Mr. Chatsky. Mr. Wilson? Sure. Um, first off, uh, I like Scarborough Park, having taken the train for many years and walking it with my son when he was a little guy, watching the train. But I think, you know, let's be clear, uh, part of this job is prioritizing. And what we have prioritized in the last several years has been really more in the center of the village on the uh, complex here and on the fields. And uh, with respect to the capital plan, I believe there is actually money in there for a study uh, on the rec center. I believe there's also money in there, uh, if it's not listed on the page, for the parking lot here and the pond desultification, all in law park. And I believe that there's also work underway on the atria field. So th that's, that's where law park is. But more importantly, I think it's true that the Scarborough Park has been somewhat neglected and always kicked the can down the road, as, as well as Chilmark for that matter. And I think we had looked at uh, hopefully with some development monies and impact monies uh, to help fund some of those from the village side. Uh, with respect to impact money on the club, uh, it's about $12 million of value that the village has received, uh, Mr. Midgley. So we do have that and we're looking at putting in impact values on uh, any units that are built on the uh, B zone or PACE. Uh, more importantly, on Scarborough, right now with the Tapathy Bridge, Mario Cuomo Bridge, and the different bike trails, I've been working with people on those things, there may be some money available for connecting scenic Hudson trails, Hudson River trails, and also some bike trails over there. That may kick in some money. Will it pay for half of it? Probably not. But it may pay for some signage and other improvements and connecting walking trails up the Hudson. So that may be some money that could help with the village fund some improvements over there. Is it going to happen next week? No, but it might be in the next, say, 18 months. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. Mr. Vessio, your turn. I, I hear 18 months. I just wonder what happened for the last four years. 2015, nominate uh, the uh, Meet the Candidates meeting. Both Mayor Wilson, Mayor, uh, Mayor Sullivan and Mark Wilson. Update sidewalk. Chilmark Park redevelopment. Redevelopment of Youth Center. Mark Wilson. Scarborough Park. Finishing off Chilmark Park. It's been four years. 2017, again. Same things. Are we going to do it? Let's get it done already. It's washing away. I was there this morning. It's literally washing away. This great asset we have, our only piece of riverfront, is going to go away. We're not going to have it anymore. We have to stop talking. We have to start acting. 
At a minimum, we need to stabilize it. It doesn't cost that much. We have a great DPW force. We can buy some materials. We can place it. We can save what's left. We have to. This is my bread and butter. Every day, I'm out in the field, I'm in the office, I understand construction inside and out, and I under, understand how to do it efficiently and cost effectively. We talk about money for the rec center. There's been no resolution approved as of yet to spend that money. These things, these goals seem to just sit. We have got to move forward as a village. We are stagnant right now, and we have great assets. Chilmark Park is one of our most underutilized assets in the village. It is huge. I used to play base softball there on Saturdays. It's the same basketball court I played, I played ball on. It's the same softball cage. It's time for some upgrades. This is Briarcliff. We can do better than that. We shouldn't let our assets deteriorate. We need to not only protect them, but we need to upgrade them. And I am for spending village money on it. Thank you, Mr. Vessio. Mr. Bidgley, you have one minute response time. <laughs> I, I have to agree with Steve. We, we have some wonderful parks. Um, we really need to do a better job, A, of promoting them amongst the village. Um, and as they get promoted, I think, and, and Peter brought this up, if we can get the villages to the park, we will have a village clamoring to, you know, fix up Scarborough Park. The idea of uh, doing food trucks, you know, here at Law Park, I thought was brilliant. Uh, you know, do that in the summertime, is you know, and have have a, a fun environment where people could come and eat dinner and go for a swim. I think the same thing could be done at Scarborough Park. You could have a concert down there, concert on the riverfront in Briarcliff, getting off the train and having a food truck there or a beer truck or something like that. I know we'd have some issues with the police on that, but um, we can do better. Is that it. You know, it's, easy to, up, it's easy to keep Thank saying you. we can do better, we can do this. What Ned just said is correct, but he doesn't realize that we already did bring food trucks. Uh, we do have a concession at the pool. You can't bring a food truck and have somebody pay for a concession at the pool. It's uh, bad business. Um, again, the parks, we've invested in the parks. Uh, we have a lot of great fields. Um, I understand Chilmark can use an upgrade. Uh, we've been talking about that not just with this board, but you know, when you look at the year here, um, it says December 2008. You know, our administration isn't the only one that's been working on this. Now, I, you know, I think it's a good idea, and I'm behind it. I think that the fields are very important. I'm very big into recreation. But you can't always just say, yeah, do it, do it, do it. And that's all I hear. Spend your money, spend your money, spend your money. It's your taxes. You can't spend it on everything. We've been fiscally responsible, and we've done a lot. Whether it's the new pavilion, whether it's the playground, we've been, you know, we've managed a lot of crisis. Thank you, Mr. Zerman. Mr. Chatsky. Two corrections here. First, um, it wasn't food trucks and the current concession at the pool, which uh, gets mixed reviews, I think, from the community. Yeah, food trucks it was when the concession. food trucks in lieu of the when current. the pavilion burnt down. Okay. Correct. Second, um, uh, I would not advise a beer truck because I don't believe the village allows alcohol in the parks, and I don't think we're changing that. And stop bringing that up. We're not going to change it. <laughs> um, third of all, I, I thought I was running for the <laughs> Supreme Court. I just, I just, <laughs> good one. Uh, I just want to highlight something that keeps coming up here. We talk about. Uh, I agree there are priorities, but rebuilding a pavilion that was burned down by arson, a playground getting hit by a tree, settling the Trump lawsuit at a loss of $200,000 when there was damage at, uh, at Law Park. These are things that come up. They're, they're almost ministerial. Some, a tree falls, village staff can take care of that. It doesn't require the BOT to sit down and talk about how do we fix every little thing that popped up. The BOT should be doing long-term okay. planning. They should be, you know, plans Thank you, Mr. Chatsky. Your time's up. It is. Mr. Wilson. <laughs> Certainly. Um, again, as Brian mentioned, there are priorities. We wish we could do everything all at once, but we have to, in this tax environment, maintain adherence to the tax cap 
and make sure we can provide all of the other services. And again, the prioritization has been in the village center. Uh, we can move out and work on Scarborough Park where it makes sense, where we can get partners to do it with us, public or private, if people want to donate. But again, we, we need to prioritize. And with respect to the concert series, uh, perhaps you missed it, uh, Mr. Midgley, but there was a concert series right over here. And it was great. It was well attended. Uh, I spoke at a couple, and uh, we had a lot of fun. So there is one already here, and it's great with with food and everything else. With a concession. With, I yeah. watched that. The, right. 105 I watched that concerts to the pavilion. Then, then let's bring it to Scarborough Park. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. And I'd appreciate it if everybody would refrain from cross commenting. We like each other. I know that. <laughs> Mr. Vessio, your turn. Okay. As a CFO, I'm the only one who gets to do that. As a CFO for a heavy highway construction firm, I'm very used to prioritizing where we're going to spend the money. Okay? Uh, we need to spend money smartly in this village, and not spending money for the sake of saving money is bad policy. We need to spend money to protect our assets. Otherwise, we're not going to have them anymore. Our pool is a good example of that, and I'm glad, glad Brian brought it up. I've been going there since I'm a kid. It's the same pool. It has had minimal upgrades, and it needs more. I think that we should bring our pool, look at bringing our pool further up to spec. But in it, even before that, there's some small, simple things we can do that would make the pool a lot more fun. How about some live music? How about some lawn games? How about the lifeguards put the chairs out for the residents so people don't have to carry chairs on top of all their stuff? There's a lot of little things we can do here that's going to make living in Briarcliff even better. And it doesn't cost a lot of money to do those things. It's just simply a policy change. Thank you, Mr. Vessio. We're, we're more than 90 minutes in, so I think it's going to run out soon. I'm going to be given a warning when it's two hours. Okay. okay. All right, we uh, will now. Sh I'm sorry. It's a two hour clip. Two hour clip. Um, we'll start the questioning going in the other direction, and again, I'm going to override one of my favorite questions that had to do with uh, the Homestead Act and the town of Ossining. And this question is submitted by someone who has offered to uh, join the uh, caucus executive committee after the election is over, Roger Bhattacharya. Over the past few years, our downtown village has been inadequately maintained. Sidewalks are in disrepair, shops are disappearing, and the overall appearance is not what it once was. How do you plan to address these items? First, first time. you. Okay. Uh, the downtown is in need of some uh, updating. We can't expect to have people coming in to start a business when it looks in the condition it does. The bricks are out of line. Uh, the sidewalks are a little narrow. It's uh, not an easy project. It's something that I'm very well versed in. Uh, the first thing, in my opinion, that we need to do is get the utilities out of the sidewalk. We can put them in the street. We can do that at night, which would uh, minimize impacts on the, the traffic as well as the businesses. Once we remove those utilities from the sidewalk, it's then a lot faster to go in and replace the sidewalk. If we didn't do that, we'd have to go take the sidewalk out, then either repair or replace the utilities, then put the sidewalk back. By moving them, the process of replacing the sidewalk will go much faster. I know there was a downtown business advisory committee formed. There were some good recommendations. Some of them are within the village's control. Some of them are not. Uh, but we do need a very smart plan in place whenever we get to doing this work. If we don't, it will be a nightmare in the downtown. The stores will lose business. Traffic will back up. And most likely, there will be trip and fall accidents. Uh, if it's managed anything like the county project that was recently managed, I can assure you those things will happen. Uh, we need to take attention to our downtown. It is our biggest asset. It's our selling feature. When people go to buy a house in Briarcliff, they look at our downtown. They want to see a nice place. They want to see a lively place. Uh, we, need to, we need to put some more attention to it. Thank you, Mr. Vessio. Mr. Wilson. Sure. Um, well, as, as was mentioned, we do have a downtown advisory council chaired by Lou Octel that went through a series of recommendations and we're working and phasing them. The beautification and, uh, you know, some of the blocking and tackling of recycling, uh, trash cans, et cetera, you know, those are already implemented. The first phase of a sidewalk replacement are being looked at now between Village Hall and the patio, and uh, he's on that in addition to, I've asked the Garden Club to take a look at any tree issues, as well as if we have this Conservation Advisory Council up to speed, we can uh, have some people there. With respect to the actual downtown project, 
Uh, there's issues with who owns the sidewalks. There's private property there. And the actual cost that's been estimated, and I see Phil back there, it's about a buck and a half to two million on each side of the street. So before we ask taxpayers to pay three to four million bucks for other people's property, even though it makes it look nicer, perhaps we should see in this tax cap compliant world if that's what we want to do. Um, again, since Mr. Chatsky was on the board, uh, the tax cap world has come into play, and, and we have to be vigilant on that, plus with the lack of the SALT deductions. So we have to be responsible. You've got to look at need-to-haves versus nice-to-haves. Now, the need-to-have that we did recently is I pushed Phil and Dave to fix the drainage issue that was undermining the stores uh, over by where Chazar's store is and the others. And for 40 grand, we fixed that. Uh, with respect to the county project, the county project is 8 to $10 million, and we have a, I've heard this before, we do have a punch list bucket of about 250, of which about 60 is left, and the sidewalk in question, basically the big debate is fake pink bricks sidewalks versus gray sidewalks. One's about 45 grand, one's about 60 grand. That's the difference. That's the big controversy of the county sidewalks. So again, um, you know, you have to be prudent with taxpayer funds. You just can't promise everything is a nice to have. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. Mr. Chatsky, you're up. I don't have a ready answer for fixing the downtown business district. I think it's a, a substantial project, and I agree it's probably going to take a lot of money. It's going to take some design. It's going to take some thought. Uh, I am not up to speed uh, in terms of any proposals you guys have in front of you. I have not seen those. One thing or a couple of things you can certainly do, um, even if sidewalks are privately owned, I think it becomes a code enforcement issue for the village because the village... Um, does the same thing with even sidewalks that have to be shoveled for snow. I think you could make under the same, the same logic that there is a um, uh, liability issue and it, there is certainly going to be accidents. And I think the village can um, uh, use its hammer to make sure these things get taken care of. There is graffiti on the side of a building um, outside the patio that has been there for years as far as I can tell. I remember uh, at least 10, 12 years ago that was repainted white, the graffiti came through, it's been sitting there forever. There are signage issues that I think should be taken care of. I actually don't think it's proper for a business to move into an old site and sort of cookie cutter a, a quick solution for a sign. I think that we should have better enforcement to make sure that signs are not temporarily fixed and then there for year after year after year. These are just cosmetic things that I think would make the downtown uh, more attractive. Thank you, Mr. Chatsky. Mr. Zerman, your turn. Well, first, thank you very much, Lou Wachtel, for heading up the committee. Um, it's not as simple as uh, doing, just going in and doing the work. As everybody said, there's a large cost, but there's issues with trees. All the trees in the downtown area are the wrong trees, and they are the reason that all the bricks are uprooted with the roots coming through. So you have an issue of taking down all those trees. Um, what do we do about losing stores? We have one store that's empty in the downtown area. Um, we, we did do a survey. Uh, people want a bakery, a cafe. And personally, I've gone out to uh, White Plains Bakery. I've gone to Martins in Scarsdale. I've gone to the Austin Bakery. I've gone out and solicited people to come in. Um, I would like to see us improve it. It's a long-term issue. Um, it's more than just the village. It's about what Lou Wachtel always says, take pride in your own business. The uh, people in the downtown area, I support. I go to all the stores and buy my food downtown. Um, but they have to fix their stores. The landlords have to step up and fix their stores. Um, and the village does have to get a long-term plan to improve the downtown area. And I wish it was so simple we would have already had it done. Um, but two million here, two million there, three million there, your taxes go up. Our salt taxes are, we're not going to get the deduction. So I'm sure nobody here is looking for us to increase their taxes as well. Um, it's not a good excuse, but it is a reality. 30 seconds, all right, thank you. Um, I agree that we do have to work on the plan, and I have worked with Lou uh, very closely on the downtown advisory committee. Thank you, Mr. Zerman. Last up is Mr. Midgley. Downtown, again, it's, it's, it's a very complicated issue. I have to agree with pretty much what everyone has said. I think we all want a nice downtown. Um, you know, we have issues with public and private property. 
Uh, one of the things I, I will commend, uh, you know, the, the current board with is I did see that they did some zoning changes for the downtown district. That's a longer term fix that might allow for multi-story, right, by multi-story, it's two or three story, you know, in other words, having retail on the bottom and an apartment above and parking behind. That's, that's a village character sort of thing. You can see that on Beekman Avenue in, in uh, formerly North Tarrytown. But you, it, the idea of having a thriving village where actually people can live in the village on the village street. And I think once that starts happening, you're going to get these improvements. And that's, that's a longer term solution, but at least uh, there was foresight done recently that will f allow for that use uh, to potentially develop. But again, that doesn't fix it in the here and now. Um, I, I think Peter's idea of code enforcement is really important. The liability issues with sidewalks, with snow cleaning, they're all tied together. And they have, it, first it has to be safe. Um, the beautification, look, if we had a $10 million budget um, granted to us from, uh, from above, then it might be a nice thing to do. But, you know, I, I think it, at first, I, from what I'm hearing, is we have a lot of basic blocking and tackling to do first. Let's preserve <laughs> what we have, and then we can do the nice projects. But we do have to preserve. And if you're not spending money on preservation, it's going to cost you a lot more five or ten years down the line. Thank you, Mr. Midgley. Mr. Vessio, you have one minute response. No one's saying to go spend millions of dollars. <clears throat> Let's be clear. But we need to plan for these improvements. And we need to do that now. We need to figure out what we're going to do with these assets, how much it's going to cost, so we can budget for it in a timely manner. And they may not happen today or tomorrow or next year or the year after. Uh, we do have a problem with the county sidewalk. It's not the sidewalk by Sidens. Uh, it's the sidewalk that we missed, the half a mile gap. We already signed the agreement. We're taking the road from them. This is per the plans. There's no sidewalk plan there. So we're going to be up for $350,000 if we want to have a continuous sidewalk through our village. Pleasantville messed up too, so we shouldn't feel too bad. They're missing a half a mile gap. But wouldn't it be great if we could both fill those gaps and put some pressure on the county and be able to walk from Pleasantville to Briarcliff or ride your bike on sidewalk? That would be fantastic. Thank you, Mr. Vessio. Mr. Wilson. Thank you. A um, couple of things. First off, uh, bullet 12 on our uh, top 12 ac accomplishments is permitted carry out food establishments to have limited seating for food consumption. That was actually something we passed to enable cafes. In other words, not restaurants, but cafes. Oh, my goodness, right? Um, <laughs> anyway. So, so we put that in. We also put in, in my first term, the CB zoning, which was the um, mixed use. And in fact, I was the one who caught the fact that the attorneys had dropped CB2, the other side, alerted the then mayor, and we fixed it, and we got both passed. So it's allowed actually on both sides of 9A. This side, multi-story and sort of adjacent, sort of by like 10510 in those places. So that's a good idea. Unfortunately, we haven't had too many people take us up on it yet, but it may Takes change. Time. It may change. And that's when probably, to your point, it makes a lot of sense then for the village to then maybe invest some money etc. In, in some improvements, whatever. But with the same old stores there, it really doesn't make a lot of sense. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. Mr. Chatsky. Again, I think code enforcement, I think minor, minor beautification would go a long way until we have a more long-range solution. And I'd just like to emphasize how great it would be to have someone on the board who has specific experience with building sidewalks, moving utilities, fixing roadways. I think Steve's skills here would probably be pretty valuable for long-range planning. 15 seconds, that's it. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chatsky. Are you timing um, yourself, or was that <clears throat> off the cuff? In my head. Okay. <laughs> Two points. Uh, what Steve said is correct about the sidewalk, but just because we signed the agreement doesn't mean it's done. Phil, correct me if I'm wrong. We have to accept the road and the sidewalk, so it's not a done deal. Secondly, um, if you look at the west side of uh, the downtown area, the uh, right of way is in the middle of the street. The, prop the property owners own the part of the parking spaces, so it's very complicated. I'm sure Phil would be happy to show you the plan. So it's not even the, um, in the 70s when they made the diagonal 
parking spaces, we had to go onto um, private property to do that. So we don't really have a right of way on the east side. I'm done. Thank you, Mr. Zerman. Last up, Mr. Midgley. <coughs> Again, I think it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's something that the village will evolve with time. I think, and to your point, I, I think putting the, uh, the proper zoning in place to allow it to evolve to a, to a potentially slightly higher density, but then allowing residents to, you know, essentially live in the middle of the village. Um, you know, sell your home on Law Road and move into, move into a two-bedroom ab above your favorite cafe. What a nice idea. Um, it hasn't happened yet. It'll happen. It'll happen, and it's the sort of development that's the right scale and character for the village. Um, you know, those are the types of things we should be encouraging. Thank you, Mr. Midgley. We've completed five questions. How are we doing for recording time, Cecilia? Okay. I'm going to ask a favorite question of the caucus. If you are unsuccessful in obtaining the People's Caucus line on the village election ballot, is it your present intention to seek another independent ballot line? We start with Mr. Midgley this time. I need two minutes for this. The, the answer is no. I will probably not run. I will probably not. Run? I will not run yet unless I'm the caucus candidate. And it's also important to me that my partners uh, in this, the, that Peter and Steve would also, you know, uh, be elected and selected. So, no, I would not run along. Thank you for that. And I'm going to interject here, since we raised this question as the caucus, we believe strongly that the caucus serves a real purpose. And I think the quality of the candidates you're seeing tonight suggests that we've had some success in doing that. It sounds like you have a real choice, and I'm glad it's taken eight years that I've been on the executive committee to have this good a slate of nominees, and I appreciate it very much. Mr. Zerman, would you take the question? Well, I want to thank the executive committee of the caucus for doing all this work. I work diligently on the executive committee, uh, informing people, telling people to get out and vote, get involved. And I certainly would not disrespect the caucus. No, I would not. Thank you very much. Mr. Chatsky? Raise your hand. No, no I, this is a surprise question for me here. Um, <laughs> I've written out my answer just to make sure none of my words are possibly misconstrued. I'm running as one of three on a slate. In the past, I have always respected the nonpartisan intent of the caucus and the goal to solicit candidates for local office. I do think the requirement for a non-binding caucus election can be revisited, but, but that will not impact my decision this time. To be clear, if I lose the caucus primary, I will not seek a trustee position in the March 2019 general election. I thank you for your response. Mr. Wilson. Okay, it's easy for me. Uh, I've been the caucus candidate three times in a row. I've agreed to that pledge each time. At this time, number four, I agree to the same. Uh, I would not run against the caucus if I don't win on Wednesday, and uh, I won't trash talk the winners if I don't win either. <laughs> I think that's, that's a good pledge. I probably won't get petitions for them, but I, uh, I won't uh, trash talk. Thank you very much, Mr. Wilson. <laughs> Mr. Vessio. I greatly respect the caucus. It's a longstanding tradition in Briarcliff. I think it's a great system. I mean, evidenced right here by all of you. I'd like to take a quick minute to thank everybody and anybody who has been involved with the caucus in keeping that alive. There was a time where it was a little shaky and every, all the residents really stepped up to the plate on that and I'm glad to be sitting here. Uh, no, I will not. Very clear, plain and simple, no. What a good wife. All right, everybody. Did you ask the rest of us if we want the one? I'm, oh, I'm yeah. going to interject the plug. <laughs> I don't like the idea of the beer truck either, so I have an alternative. Since I'm a winemaker and some of you guys have tried my wines, wine I will truck. be happy to donate wines for a wine truck or wine stand, and we can use that as an alternative. Are we heading my wines too? 
My editor and I make them together. Okay. I volunteer my house. All right. Concert <laughs> <laughs> okay. at the Jaegers tomorrow night. <laughs> so we're now going to move into the closing statements. And this time we're going to start from right to left. Mr. Midgley, please go forward. No more questions? <laughs> Three minutes, and if you want to do less, we're happy to have you do less. <laughs> <laughs> well, a lot, a lot has been said tonight, um, and I think both sides have made cases for their uh, cases for their candidacies, and you know the hope, and the hope is that our slate, my slate, with Peter and Steve, will be sitting here for a fairly long time. Um, we talked about a lot of things, um, you know, and, you know, and we, we, uh, I will make a commitment to try and get done as many things as we, as, as possible that we have promised that we can do. Um, there are limitations, I, I recognize that. Um, we all want to keep taxes low, um, which is one of the reasons I, uh, the idea of Tax, if, the, if the village chooses that it wants to develop itself, I do think that we as a village should profit from it. Uh, the impact fees are something that we should definitely consider, uh, and not just an, on a negotiated basis with each individual developer, but have some stated uh, you know, basic minimums. Um, because <coughs> negotiations with developers without um, sort of legislative backing, for lack of a better uh, term, uh, y you can always get accused of doing things in, in the background and not being transparent about it. I believe it's important to be transparent and have expectations of developers to come in, do the project right, and actually to be good stewards of, of what they, of, uh, of, of the project that they're, that they're potentially developing. Um, I'm a proud resident of, of 21 years. Um, I, I hope to have another 21 here in Briarcliff. Uh, but we, we, we do sit at a crossroads. I used that word numerous times tonight, numerous times last week. The fact that as many people turned out today as they did, I think is a really good sign for the village because it's going to inform a consensus that we're going to be able to take and try and pick and choose the projects that we think are right for Briarcliff going forward. You don't have to say yes. You have to have the ability to say no. I have that ability. Um, and, and in addition to the ability to say no to certain things, um, we live in a great place. And we have the ability to keep it a great place. Thanks for your time. Thank you, Mr. Midgley. First, <laughs> let me agree with Ned and just say that uh, we did say no. You know, you guys asked us not to let them build at the Sony, and we said no. Um, I'm going to thank Steve and Peter and Ned. They've made it very interesting. I'm not a promiser. I'm a doer. You might know me as a trustee. You might have seen me in town handing out flyers for the Executive Committee for the People's Caucus. I worked my butt off for three years getting people involved. Because we couldn't get candidates involved, uh, I think it was John O'Leary asked me to step up. I sat through a year of uh, meetings at the uh, Board of Trustees before I felt comfortable, and I stepped up and ran for a board, and I've been on the board for four years. You might know me as the person, if you went to the sing-along with your child uh, Christmas, I was the person behind the counter handing them Hot chocolate. Thankfully, Cider. he wasn't singing. <laughs> well, Aaron's daughter was singing. She's very good. Um, I was a person handing out the goodies. I was at community day, you know, working the, uh, the different games, setting up, breaking down. Um, I was a board member at the, I'm still a board member at the Barcliff Youth uh, Soccer Club. Very active. Um, I'm on the rec, rec, um, rec board for 10 plus years, involved with the uh, different parks. When you say Chilmark, you're not doing anything. Bill, I'm sorry, but Chilmark was on your tour. We, that's been talked about for 10 plus years. So it's not something that we've neglected. It's something that's been on the back burner, and I'm sorry about that. You might know me as a coach, you know, coaching your kids. 
Uh, you might know me as the assistant ASO commissioner. I was the guy on Sunday putting the crooked lines on the soccer fields. Um, I sit in every ZBA, every zoning board meeting. I sit in every planning board meeting. Um, if you're a resident, you have a problem, you call me, I call you back. I am your point of contact. I never duck anybody's call, anybody's question. I'll come over to your house, even if I don't know you. I'll come right over because that's my job. And you guys are doing a good job. Um, you might even have seen me again. I'm not going to brag, but I must have hit 20 points at the, uh, the Barcliffe Rotary game against the Harlem Wizards. I was that good. <laughs> That's one reason you should vote for me, in case you need me. Um, you know, basically, we have a strong board. We listen to the residents. We've worked hard for you. It's easy to promise the world. It's very hard to keep that budget, to keep your taxes low, to fulfill all the needs. 30 seconds, I don't even need that much. I want to thank everybody for coming out, for participating, especially the Jaegers who've opened the bark, uh, opened our eyes up with a lot of things, and we're, we're working hard, Bruce. I'm sorry we're so late on that. But thank you very much. Thank you, Peter, Mark, Steve, and Ned. Thank you, Mr. Zerman. I didn't happen to see you at the Harlem Globetrotters game, but Aaron oh, Spring, Wizards, Wizards. Wizards, sorry. Aaron Spring coaches youth soccer over in Ossining and basketball, sorry. And my granddaughters are part of that. I think he would beat you one on one. I'm and 59 years old. He could beat me <laughs> <laughs> two of them. And, and, the anyway. truth, and the truth be told, when I was playing, I stood in the corner and Stanley passed me the ball, and that's all I could do. Thank you. Pete, you need some extra time? <laughs> and, <laughs> Mr. Chatsky, it's your turn. I would like to start by pointing out I love that hat. That is an awesome hat. Good Peter, job. Peter designed this hat. It's, it's from his <laughs> it's nothing. administration. Uh, I'll start by thanking once again the caucus executive committee for arranging tonight's event. I would also like to thank Lori, Mark, and Brian. I applaud any resident who donates the time, the energy to serve our community. Whether serving in a volunteer fire department, joining a government board or committee, chaperoning a school event, or coaching Little League. That's for you. Our entire community is enriched by the people who give their time so generously. It's certainly a special honor to be elected to represent the residents of this village. My decision to run this year is not and should not be viewed as a personal swipe against any of the incumbents. Mark Wilson and I share a personal trainer. I often see him at the gym. Brian Zerman lives only two houses away. He's a great neighbor. He's a friend. He had dinner at my house only two Sundays ago. I rarely run into Lori Sullivan. I have no doubt we have common love in this community. None of that will change, no matter what the result of the election is. This year, voters have a real choice to make. There are differences between the candidates, differences in real-world experience, in dealing with public concerns, in focusing on putting out fires versus long-range planning. It is time, I believe, for a new approach. I hope I have your support. I hope next week you'll vote for Steve Vessio, Peter Chatsky, and Ned Midgley as your next slate of People's Caucus candidates. And again, I want to thank all of you for coming out tonight. Thank you, Mr. Chatsky. Mr. Wilson, you've got your final three sure. minutes to close. Absolutely. Yes, I did. I apologize. Can you make her closing statement? Come on up, please. Yeah, okay. Gives me a chance to sit down. I'm happy for that. If you want to take more than three minutes, I'll let you. Okay. <laughs> Again, uh, <clears throat> Lori feels terrible that she can't be here tonight. She would have really enjoyed to see the passion of everybody in this room tonight. It warms my heart as somebody who loves Briarcliff that we have so many caring people for our village. From Lori, once again I would like to thank the caucus, the candidates, and all of the residents of Briarcliff Manor for understanding my inability to be present tonight and allowing me to take part in the process and let my voice be heard. While there is always, in every election, an undercurrent theme of, I can do better, 
I believe what has been accomplished over the past four years has planned for the next two. Allows me to say that with me as your mayor and the Board of Trustees, as is intact, we have and will continue every day making Briarcliff better than ever. We will continue making Briarcliff better than ever based upon all residents' best interest, not in the best interest of a select few, and have and will continue to do so where possible with partners such as the state, county, town, school districts based upon repaired relationships. We all recognize the land use development issues that are likely to come up during the next two years, and I remain adamant that each property will be individually dealt with through the process without global legislations as suggested and will require our planning board to be stewards of the analysis as is the historical path of our village. Voted best upon our four-year record and further plans and goals and not on maybes and what-ifs for the future. I thank my fellow board members, Deputy Mayor Cesar DeRose, Trustee mm -hmm. Mark Wilson, Set shot Brian Zimmerman and trustee Kevin Hunt, his predecessor Mark Power, for his dedication and commitment to our village for collectively the past four years, allowing for incredible accomplishments and future planning, and look forward to what we can accomplish during the next two years. I thank you, and I hope your support by your vote on Wednesday, January 23, 2019, at the Youth Center between 3 p.m. and 9 p.m. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Wachtel, and we thank you for standing in. Um, Mr. Chatsky, you have three minutes. Oh, is it you, Mark? I'm sorry. Did, did I? <clears throat> All right. I guess I screwed up. I let you up out of order, Lou. You no, 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 we're okay. We're oh, okay. we're okay. okay. I'm sorry. Okay, we're going right to left. All right. So let's. I, I don't know which side. Yeah. Are we, re are we ready? Okay. <laughs> yes, Mark. Sorry. As I said two hours ago, we are running on our record of making Briarcliff better than ever for all. Our top 12 goals and plans are available both electronically and in paper formats. In a nutshell, we will continue providing services and an environment that are the envy of the New York metro area while remaining prudently compliant with the New York State tax cap and strengthening bond ratings. We will continue the phased improvements at Law Park as well as moving forward on the atria fields and the recreation center analysis. Improvements for first responders at Village Hall will be evaluated as will Total Road. We will take possession of Pleasantville Road as the Pacantico River Bridge is completed. In addition, we will continue the use of resident committees to facilitate input and transparency as we navigate through difficult land use processes and other issues. We will strengthen and support the planning board. Finally, we will continue our dedication to constituent services, including protecting residents' rights, regardless of when the issue originated. I think that the choices are clear. You can either re-elect a team with a demonstrated track record and the qualifications of, one, broad and deep roots in the Briarcliff community, including ourselves, our spouses, and our children. Two, wide-ranging skills arising from our multi-decade business <coughs> careers. Three, a bias towards action. Four, a sense of stewardship. And five, building and leveraging relationships for the benefit of all Briarcliff residents. Or, you can roll the dice and take a flyer on one, two, or three of the challengers. The choice is yours to make. On behalf of Mayor Sullivan, Trustee Zerman, and myself, thank you for your time this evening. We respectfully request the honor of your votes on Wednesday. Re-elect us to continue making Briarcliff better than ever for all. Good night. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. Mr. Vessio, you're the cleanup hitter tonight. Thank you all. Thank you all for staying. It's after 10 o'clock. That's, that's really amazing. Um, this is an exciting opportunity for me. I've been giving back to Briarcliff for the last 15 years since uh, I graduated college. Uh, I've been a lifelong resident. I've seen a lot of changes here. Uh, 15 years ago, I joined the fire department. It definitely changed me as a person. I, I grew to become the um, captain of Scarborough Engine by the age of 27, uh, leading a force of 40 men and women. 
uh, into fires and at emergency scenes, including the tanker fire on Route 9A. Uh, I joined the planning board four years ago, and I found that to be extremely uh, beneficial and rewarding to give back to the community and see a real-world impact. I then chaired the B-Zone Advisory Committee, which is our biggest issue. Uh, we need to handle that situation right, and we really need the people in place who have the skill set to do it. And I believe that myself, Ned, and Peter would, would be those people. Uh, if, you haven't, if you couldn't tell by tonight, I'm a pretty passionate guy. Uh, I speak from the heart. I'm high energy. I, uh, I work a lot, so I don't sleep as much. I'm dedicated to what I do. Uh, you can see just from my preparation tonight that I really dig into issues. I want to learn everything about them so we can come up with the best possible solution. And I want to solicit input from the residents. Because at the end of the day, it's all about the residents. This is your village. You should determine what the course will be, not the panel of people sitting up on this table. If elected mayor, if I have the privilege and honor to be elected your mayor, I promise I will represent you all. I promise I will work hard for you. I promise I will work tirelessly. And I promise if you have a problem, you can come to me, and I will do my best to help you. Please come out next Wednesday. Please vote for myself, Ned, and Peter. Please continue to support a better Briarcliff. It's a wonderful place to live. Uh, I love it here. And I couldn't think of anywhere to raise, else to raise my family. So thank you all for coming, and, and thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vassilou. I'm going to ask if there is any other business that anyone wants to bring before the caucus at this meeting. Seeing none, we're going to move on. I want to thank everybody for their efforts. I want to make a couple of comments on behalf of the caucus. The executive committee was faced with a number of challenges this time to make decisions kind of on the fly where we didn't have precedent before us. I'm sure we offended some people. We did the best we could. We stand by what we did. We attempted to do it in a spirit of fairness and transparency. I hope you all agree. I'm really pleased at the turnout. It makes me feel that the last eight years have been worthwhile. So thank you all. I'm going to seek a motion to adjourn. Mr. O'Leary, do we have a second? Mr. Vessio, thank you. We are adjourned. <laughs> Good job. You too.